Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about coronary artery disease in the elderly. I understand that was a, a topic you particularly wanted covering. Uh, and coronary artery disease, the treatment of coronary artery disease, encompasses three different issues. Uh, the treatment of acute coronary syndromes, the management of stable angina, and of course, the delivery of secondary prevention. Um, and I'm going to illustrate my talk uh, by talking through my management of a chap called Dennis, who, as you can see, was born in 1918. Very interesting life. He was called up in the Second World War to go and fight in North Africa and fought through Libya and thought probably that was all he would have to do, but was then called up in 1943 and headed off to Sicily and thought definitely that's all I'm going to have to do. Uh, until he was called up for D-Day. He was quite relieved to see in his letter that it was D-Day plus 15 until he was told it wasn't plus 15 days, it was plus 15 minutes, and it was actually in, in the second wave. Um, following this, he remained well for 64 years, had no problems, lived a completely independent life um, until 2008 when he developed chest pain. So the treatment for this gentleman was primary angioplasty. What are the problems with thrombolysis? Well, in an inferior myocardial infarction, in a 90-year-old man, benefits probably not that great, and there would be a substantial risk of uh, hemorrhage, particularly cerebral hemorrhage. Conservative treatment of a myocardial infarction in a 90-year-old is associated with a massive mortality. So primary angioplasty. Given that this gentleman was fully active, and independent. What are the problems with primary angioplasty? Well, of course, there is a risk of death, stroke, vascular complications, renal impairment inherent in the procedure. But we know that overall it will lead to a substantial reduction in mortality, is likely to on balance, uh, and that will maintain left ventricular function and therefore maintain quality of life. And we can use a radial access these days rather than a femoral access, and we know that that massively reduces vascular complications. So this chap, here's his right coronary artery, which is blocked. And also, here's his left coronary artery. And you can see here, this is LAD, heavily diseased. And this is his circumflex, heavily diseased. What you may also be able to see here is this calcified, barely moving structure, which is the aortic valve. So he has aortic stenosis, severely diseased left coronary artery, and an occluded right coronary artery. Unfortunately, he responded very well to primary angioplasty. Artery was opened, and a bare metal stent put in the proximal right coronary artery. Okay. So, he's then well, he's on the ward in the hospital. What are the issues then? Well, one issue is what are you going to do with the residual coronary artery disease, which we'll come back to in a minute, and secondary preventative medication. And you're concerned about giving all these drugs, aspirin, clopidogrel, statin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, to a 90-year-old man. Okay, so what are the issues? Well, with aspirin, there's a clear indication there. In fact, there's three clear indications there. He's undergone PCI. He's had a heart attack, he's got coronary artery disease. All of those are indications for aspirin. And there's lots of uh, evidence to demonstrate that their aspirin will be beneficial for this gentleman. What are the concerns? Might be a bit concerned about the platelet count, but the main concern will be GI bleeding, and that is a concern in the older people. But he's definitely going to require aspirin, and you would routinely give a proton pump inhibitor in these people of this sort of age. Clopidogrel, similar, and again, cover with uh, proton pump inhibitors. And this is important that you put in a bare metal stent at the time of percutaneous coronary intervention so that you then only need the clopidogrel. You only need the clopidogrel for one month. And it can therefore be discontinued if you have any concerns at all about GI bleeding or the platelet count. Statins are uh, we routinely give high-dose statins to people presenting with acute coronary syndromes, i.e. 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. 
obviously in a lot of younger people, generally the liver function tests are not going to be abnormal, but you'd certainly want to check liver function tests in the more elderly age group, and you probably wouldn't want to be giving a torvastatin 80 milligrams up front to a 90-year-old man. So you'd be thinking about other statins. Which statins can you give? Well, this is a graph demonstrating the effect of statins, and you can see that mortality is reduced as the cholesterol level comes down in all of them. And what that tells us is that the important thing to do with these people is to get them on a statin rather than a particular statin at a particular dose. So pravastatin, 40 milligrams once daily, simvastatin, 40 milligrams once daily, atorvastatin, 10, 20, 40 milligrams once daily, all going to be beneficial for these people. Beta blockers, again, several indications. There is a concern in the more elderly people about conduction block. They often have conduction tissue disease, and you're going to be looking quite carefully at the ECG after the procedure if they've got broad QRS complexes, if they've got axis deviation, prolonged PR interval. All of those would start to make you think more about the balance between risk and benefit. There's a clear benefit, but you've got to be sure that that benefit outweighs the risk of being on a beta blocker. If there are concerns, you don't need to be starting with a 10 lol 50 milligrams. You can start right down at the dose of metoprolol 12.5 milligrams twice daily. So the standard dose in the BNF for metoprolol is metoprolol 50 milligrams two or three times daily. But you can start at a much lower dose if you have concerns about conduction block. That's also quite a useful tip in people with heart failure where a bit nervous starting uh, beta blockers. Asthma and peripheral vascular disease actually, although it's all uh, in the literature about beta blockers, generally not much of a problem. ACE inhibitors once more, lots of indications. There is a concern about renal function. Um, and once the GFR starts heading below 50 mils per minute, and certainly when it's below 30 mils per minute, you need to be very cautious in elderly people starting ACE inhibitors. But they're definitely uh, beneficial drugs, and if the GFR is over 50, then I would want to be introducing uh, an ACE inhibitor. Really, even in the context of aortic stenosis, if you've got significant impaired left ventricular function, if you don't have critical aortic stenosis, I would still want to introduce an ACE inhibitor. And again, you don't need to be introducing 5 milligrams of ramipril or 20 milligrams of lisinopril. You can get right down to the lowest dose of 1.25 milligrams of ramipril and then titrate up from there. Okay, so the treatment of residual coronary artery disease. We've seen this chap's had his right coronary artery reopened. That's looking pretty good, but he's got all that disease on the left-hand side. So... Can I ask you to vote again on what you think we should be doing with this chap? 100% saying anti-anginals. Oh, it's coming down a bit, bit of PCI. Okay. A bit of expectant management. Oh. I'll just wait for a bit longer. Everyone answered? So we've got 60% say anti-anginals. 30% say PCI, and 7% said expectant management. Okay, well, fact, we went for expectant management. So PCI, if you've got a 90-year-old man who's asymptomatic, you're not really going to be fiddling around with his coronary arteries because that has no mortality benefit. It's not going to have a mortality benefit and will involve a risk. So in the absence of symptoms, you're not going to deliver anything for him. There's no benefit for him. There's just a downside. Okay? If he's got symptoms, that's fine. You can treat the symptoms. This chap was asymptomatic. So you're going to give antianginals. Well, you could give antianginals, but you're hoping that he's already on a beta blocker for secondary prevention, and that's the most powerful antianginal. And there are problems with all the other antianginals. So calcium channel blockers are a problem, can exacerbate LV impairment, cause ankle swelling, as we know, nitrates, headaches, postural symptoms. What about nicarandal? What's the problem with nicarandal that this chap had? His concern was that he couldn't take this with Viagra. 
So, expectant management. And he did very well for another couple of years, until he was 92. And then he started becoming short of breath once more. From being able to do whatever he wanted, he was now having trouble going to the local shops. And of course, he's got three problems that might cause breathlessness. Coronary artery disease, impaired LV function, and aortic stenosis. And this is his echo. And you can see that the aortic valve, so this is the mitral valve here, which is thin and flopping around quite nicely. This is the aortic valve, which you can see is heavily calcified and barely moving. So, in a younger person, there's a whole variety of tests that one might consider, exercise stress test, in order to try and tell you what you need to do with this person who's got three things wrong with them that might be causing you symptoms. Exercise test, MRI scan, perfusion scan, stress, echo. But in fact, in this man, 92-year-old man, none of these are going to be helpful, and in fact, some of them are going to be harmful. So you just have to treat the patient empirically, and often in elderly people, that's what you have to do. A lot of the tests are not going to be helpful. You just have to treat them on your own clinical judgment. So we decided with this chap, in the first instance, there was, we were going to sort out his coronary arteries. You can see up here, he's got quite heavily calcified coronary arteries, so we had to drill them out. And I'm not showing you this just to demonstrate what an amazing cardiologist I am. I'm showing you this, although that's obviously partly the reason. Um, I'm showing you this to demonstrate this is a 92-year-old man who we're doing exceptionally complex percutaneous coronary intervention on. So just because someone's very elderly doesn't mean you can't perform complex interventions on them if they're the correctly selected patient. So we sorted out his left coronary artery. It's looking a bit better there. And then we sorted, sorry, we sorted LAD in the previous shot, and this is the circumflex coronary artery, which we've sorted out here. Okay. And then there's two ways you could interpret this picture. You could either think, so he died during the procedure and went to heaven, <laughs> or that after the procedure, he could run for a bus. And this is exactly what happened. So I saw him in clinic to decide where we were going to go on from there. And he said, I can run for a bus again now. I said, just explain what you mean by that. And he said, uh, well, Dr. Ken, and I, I can now run for a bus again. OK, excellent. So what are we going to do about his aortic valve? Got severe aortic stenosis and some impaired LV function. So can we all vote? In fact, this is a 92-year-old man who can run after a bus and wants to use Viagra. There's no way you should be doing anything to this gentleman. You should say, excellent, you carry on having a good quality life. Come back and see me if you run into any trouble. Sorry, transcatheter, you'll see in a minute. Transcatheter aortic valve implantation. OK. So expectant management. A year later, had a good quality of life. A year later, he comes back. He's becoming more short of breath again. We know he's got severe aortic stenosis. There's no percutaneous options in terms of coronary intervention. We rechecked the coronary arteries. They were as we'd left them before. <coughs> there we go. OK, so here's a little cartoon of a TAVI procedure, which I'll take you through. I'm afraid I can't point at both sides at the same time. Here's a heavily calcified aortic valve, which is not opening. It's aortic stenosis. Femoral artery, wire, up the aorta, round the aortic arch, cross the aortic valve into the left ventricle, pass a balloon, up that wire, position it across the valve, blow up the balloon, just opening up the valve, take the balloon away. Put in a bigger sheath. 
and then this is the prosthetic valve crimped down onto a balloon. Again, pass it along the wire. Just positioning it on the balloon. Position it across the native valve, prosthetic valve across the native valve. Blow up the balloon, crushing the old valve out of the way, leaving a new tissue prosthetic valve in situ. This is procedure done under local anaesthetic by the transfemoral artery, which we did on this gentleman at the age of 92 or 93. Ooh. Okay, so an interesting life, born in 1918. PCI, 2008. Primary angioplasty, 2008. Elective PCI, 2010. TAVI, 2011. I last saw him last year in clinic. He's doing absolutely fine. So, conclusion, coronary artery disease in the elderly, very common. Age is not a contraindication to treatment, but frailty and comorbidities may be. All treatment options should be considered, but you need to individualize the management. Everything you want to do to the patient, you need to balance the risk against the benefit specific to that patient. You need to consider what you're aiming to try and achieve, and you need to think about quality of life more than about quantity of life. So if you have someone who's wheelchair bound, osteoarthritis, COPD, then really fiddling around with the heart is very unlikely to improve their quality of life. On the other hand, if you've got a man who's fit, well, independent, you should be trying to do everything that you'd be doing for someone much younger. And of course, consider the patient's wishes. So a 60-year-old man with severe coronary artery disease and critical aortic stenosis who says, I don't want any treatment, you might say, well, you might try and convince them. But a 92-year-old man who says, actually, I'm quite happy to take what's coming to me, probably be happy to accept the patient's wishes without too much discussion. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.